Hi, and welcome to this video introduction to TwinGates. We are a zero trust remote access solution. Today, we'll take a look at what you need to set up to get started with TwinGate. The very first step will be for you to go to the TwinGate website, if you have not done so already, and create what we call a new network or a new tenant. Once you create a new tenant, which is free, you will end up in our admin console. The name you pick will be displayed here instead of enablement, and you will have sort of a blank environment for TwinGates. And that will be the canvas on which we will deploy things for your employees to be able to access both private and public assets. Now, when you start, think about it this way. You have a collection of employees, largely all existing in an identity provider of some kind, whether it's Okta, OneLogin, Azure AD, and so on. And you have a collection of assets that could be anything between servers, services, Kubernetes clusters, SQL databases, private web apps, various types of servers, Windows, Linux, mainframe, and so on, file shares, you name it. And it is assumed that you probably also have some SaaS applications that you're relying on to run your business, stuff like Office 365, GitHub, Salesforce, or Zoom. Now, what you wanna do with TwinGates is to protect whatever is on the right here and still make it available remotely and securely to the groups of users that are here. So the very first thing you should do in TwinGate is to actually integrate TwinGate to your identity provider. TwinGate delegates the concept of identity to an identity provider. And so it's very simple. All you need to do is really to go to the admin console under identity provider and connect your instance of your own identity provider here. Once you do this, you will see the list of users and the list of groups of users automatically populated and synced between your identity provider and TwinGates. That'll be the first step for you to get started. Now, the second piece of the puzzle is what do you need to deploy and where for your employees to gain access to all of those resources? There's a few components that you need to know about in TwinGate that are important. The first component that you need to know about are the connectors. The connectors are very lightweight components that you deploy behind the firewall. Uh, they can typically be deployed on VMs. They can be deployed as containers as well. A connector, when installed alongside another connector in the same subnet, for instance, will provide native high availability and load balancing. The deployment options is, is entirely up to you. Uh, when it comes to cloud, you actually have multiple options as to where the connectors should be. That could be in a dedicated VPC or VPC-like subnet that is speared to other VPCs with resources you're trying to uh, make available to your employees. Or the connectors could also be, that is entirely your choice, deployed directly on the VPCs themselves. That is up to you. The connector is important because the connector is what allows users to connect effectively to your resources. Now, there's a couple of things that are important to know about connectors. The first one is that, let's make sure we have our connectors set up here. The first thing is that connectors, while providing connectivity to your resources and assets, connectors do not need an open port inbound. And that is because in TwinGates, we use a relay infrastructure that we maintain and, and deploy. It's available in 16 different data centers worldwide. And the relay infrastructure is actually used to establish connection between your end users and your connectors. So connectors effectively maintain outbound connections to our relay infrastructure. This is all transparently done. So that when a user tries to connect to a resource, the user's TwinGate client, which is a component we'll talk about in a minute, the, their client will also connect to the relay infrastructure. And the relay infrastructure will then establish a peer-to-peer -peer tunnel between the end user's cl uh, client or device and the connector itself, then we'll drop the connection and we will guarantee peer-to-peer -peer between those two endpoints. Now, this brings us to the second piece that needs to be deployed, this time on the end user's device, and that's going to be the TwinGate client that is, again, available uh, 
from the App Store for Mac, or simply you can go to get.twingate.com to download the client for your operating system. We currently support Windows, Linux, Mac OS, iOS, Android, and Chrome OS. Once you have the client and you have the connector, you're in good shape. This is all going to be visible in your Twingate tenant here. So the connectors is the first thing you'll have to do. But before you install a connector, you'll actually have to create a remote network. Now, what is a remote network? A remote network is really nothing more than a cluster of connectors set up for high availability and load balancing. That is all that a remote connector is. So the first thing you'll do is you will create a remote connector. You can pick whatever location you want here. It's really more informative than anything. So we're going to call this one, um, we can call it anything really. We don't actually have to call it for VPC environments. Um, let's call this one my network one. And once you install a remote network, you will be able to install connectors. You will notice right off the bat that we very purposefully create two connectors in a remote network for redundancy purposes. And now it is up to you to go and deploy that connector. The easiest thing you can do is just click on one of the connectors that is now declared in Twingate in your account and pick the deployment option you choose. So it really divides into either a Docker container or a VM. If you want to make your life easy, you can just select Linux, spin up a small VM, generate those access tokens here. It'll generate a command that you can then run on the VM itself. This command will probably take about 30 seconds to run. And as soon as it runs, you will see controller and relay start showing in uh, connected here. And that will mean that you have a live connector in Twin Gates. You do not need to modify your firewall for connection to be established because, again, the connectors are going to maintain their own connections to the relay. And when you try to connect to those connectors, your device is going to connect to the relay, which is then going to create an encrypted uh, TLS pinned peer-to-peer uh, -peer tunnel between the device and your connector. So those are the first steps to take. Now, what we ultimately want to do is we want to grant access to the resources that are in either of those two VPCs, but also some SaaS applications. So we're going to divide this into different sections. Let's first focus on what needs to be done for the for access to resources that are behind a firewall in VPCs. By the way, there's a piece that I forgot to mention. This is the controller. The controller infrastructure is also a piece of infrastructure that is maintained by TwinGates. And the role of the controller is to synchronize all parties. So the controller will keep the clients aware of what resources they have access to, what tenants they have access to, and so on. So you can pretty much ignore those two because they're not, those are not things that you'll have to deploy and install or even care about but they're interesting to know from an architecture's perspective. Now, um, let's go back to protecting private assets here. The central concept in TwinGates in the TwinGate admin console is actually going to be the user group. A user group, again, can be synchronized from an identity provider and a user group ties together users, like DevOps engineers, finance people, sales employees, and the resources those groups should have legitimate access to. So for instance, finance is probably not going to need access to the Kubernetes cluster, but DevOps will need access to the Kubernetes cluster. And it is likely that there's things that finance has access to, such as some private web apps that the DevOps team or the sales team do not need access to. So we're going to go and take a look at how this is configured in TwinGate. But again, the central concept is the concept of a user group. The user group is going to be represented in your TwinGate admin console under teams, under groups, and it will be likely synced with your IDP, but you also have the option to create new groups. So if I create a group for DevOps, I can add users, I can add myself, for instance, but I can also add resources that I want my DevOps group to have access to, and we'll talk about that in a minute. I can also add an, a resource policy. That'll be very important later. 
Now, what is a resource? So think of resources as mapping points to endpoints you're trying to protect. If you take a closer look at the type of assets you're trying to protect here on the right side, you'll see some assets that are defined as IP addresses. You'll see some assets that are defined as fully qualified domain names. And you'll even see an asset here that is a class of servers, file shares in this case, that occupy several IPs in a CIDR block. So it is up to you to determine what access you need, what groups to have. And based on that, you can go and declare twin gate resources that your groups are going to have access to. Let's keep those in mind because we will be able to define resources in a very similar way than what is visible in a diagram. So imagine that you want your DevOps, um, your DevOps group to have access to the Kubernetes cluster. You can simply add a resource directly here. Oh, actually I need to declare it somewhere else. You can add a new resource here that you're going to tie to your remote network on AWS. And since we're trying to declare a resource that is going to point to an IP address directly, what we're going to do is simply select CIDR. We're going to call this one K8's cluster. And we're going to give this one the IP address of the cluster, 10.1.2.1, 10.1.2.1. And we can uh, also apply more restrictions. We can apply restrictions on ports and different types of protocols, but for the sake of keeping it simple today, we're going to stick to simple addresses. If I add a resource here, my resource can then be mapped to any of the groups that I've created or I've imported from my IDP. So here, if I apply it to DevOps and go back to my DevOps group, now my DevOps group will be configured to be able to remotely access to the TwinGate client the IP to the Kubernetes cluster. This isn't the only way you can define a resource. In fact, there's four ways you can declare resources. You could do more than one endpoint for a single resource. So let's say that we wanted to map all of the servers in our storage pool here, uh, 10, 1, 3, 0. So you could also do this here, 10.1.3.0, 24, which will be a valid CIDR block, uh, and just call that file shares. Same thing, you can restrict certain um, ports, but for the sake of simplicity, we're just going to stick to a side of block and assign it to the same group. Those are not the only options you have. You can also define a resource as a fully qualified domain name if you select DNS here, which would be very convenient for our purpose here, uh, providing access to db1.autoco.int. So you can do this here, co.int, db. And there's one final way you can declare resources. It is similar to the fully qualified domain names, but it is a little bit more flexible and more broad. It allows you to define patterns within fully qualified domain names. So if we wanted to provide access to all Linux servers, to our groups of DevOps users, all we would need to do here is do a Linux uh, question mark, in this case, dot autoco dot int the question mark is one of the two characters that is supported for patterns the question mark is exactly one arbitrary character but you could also do linux star which would be any number of characters between linux and dot autoco.com dot int so those would be my linux servers and again let's assign it to the same group so that our group now has access to all of those things now, the final concept that is important to understand when it comes to user groups is the fact that a user group, again, maps to resources, but a user group can have a policy that sort of guards access from, to those resources from the perspective of users. The policy is always defined at group level. You will find it under groups if you select your group. You will see that by default, it will implement a, a default policy, but you can define your own policies. Now, uh, my own policy. A policy is designed to answer three separate questions. The first question the policy is designed for is, how often should my DevOps users authenticate 
to be able to gain access to the resources they're entitled to. Every hour, every five days, every day, every 24 days, up to you to define. The second question that policy answers is, should a user from the DevOps group in this case, provide a multi-factor authentication code before being able to access a resource protected by the policy? And a third and quite important question that the policy also answers is, what should be true of the device a user is using to access a resource? That means, should the device only be a macOS device? Could it be also a Windows device? Should it have a hard drive encryption? Should it have a, an antivirus? And so on. That is what a policy does, and a policy effectively gates access to resources from groups of users. Now, let's take a look at how this also applies to SaaS resources. And before we do that, uh, one thing that is uh, needed to understand here is that Twingate is a split tunnel solution. What it means is that the way you define resources is directly going to dictate what traffic the Twingate client is going to intercept. In our experience, not all traffic needs to be intercepted by a remote access solution. Only traffic towards applications or endpoints that contain sensitive data. So in the case of SaaS, the distinction would typically be between an Office 365, a GitHub, or a Salesforce that tend to contain private data that you need to protect versus a Zoom that is very greedy in terms of bandwidth requirement, but doesn't contain much in terms of confidential data. So for this to work, the only change you would need to bring to what we've already covered is that you would need to configure your connectors to have a public exit IP that is static and doesn't change over time. If you do this, then you can configure your identity provider itself to block access to Office 365, GitHub, and Salesforce, or really any application that is registered against your IDP, unless the inbound IP address is that of a connector. What this effectively means is that because we delegate authentication to the identity provider, if Linus is at home and tries to connect to, say, GitHub without being on Twin Gates, his public IP will be a public IP that isn't that of the connector. And you can configure your IDP to actually block that connection from uh, being established. You, and, and similarly, you can configure the IDP to only allow the public exit IP of the connector to connect to GitHub, which means that all users, including Linus and Charlie, have to be connected to TwinGate so that their exit IP for the traffic towards GitHub and Okta goes through the connector at the public exit IP that is bound to the connectors and into GitHub. That is, in short, the concept behind what we call ad gating, and this is available in most identity providers today. A good example of this can be implemented in Okta, for instance, by simply declaring a network zone that will correspond to the exit public IPs of your connectors, as you can see here, and then binding specific applications to either a policy or a rule. Let's take a look at the Google Workspace rule in our environment here. So that sign on to Google Workspace can only be done if this rule applies. And if we take a look at the details of the rule, it simply states that if a user is not coming from the Twin Gates connector exit IP, then access is going to be denied. This is what this policy says here. The same can be implemented again in most identity providers today. 